Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the first hearing of the Assembly Banking and Finance Committee. Uh, this session, and today we're going to be talking about innovation and transformation in payment technologies. I would like to thank our committee members and our witnesses for attending today. Today's hearing is designed to give us some background on our existing payment systems and provide a glimpse of the future of transformation of consumer payment transactions. When we swipe our card or wave our smartphone to make a purchase, multiple entities are involved in the transaction with data traveling between the merchant, payment networks, payment processor, issuing bank, and acquiring bank. In seconds, data travels between these entities, yet we rarely step back to look at what really goes into the system. Today we will attempt to remove the mystery from this process and shed some light on the changes that are happening rapidly in our economy. These issues are not just important for policymakers to consider, as they have a direct impact on our economy, but also for consumers and the people that use this technology every day. The rollout of the EMV nationwide is estimated at $8 billion, with only 60% of businesses meeting the October 2015 deadline. This change in a way we are using our cards will require consumer and merchant education. The change to chip embedded cards coincides with the implementation of additional mobile payment technologies. Some estimates are that mobile payments will account for over $200 billion in transactions by the end of this year. It is my intention that this hearing will set the tone for this committee and the work that we do this session. When we look at an issue, I want to ensure that we are fair, deliberate, and have a solid grasp of the consequences, both positive and negative, for our actions. I will now invite any other members of this committee to make any opening comments. <laughs> Seeing no opening comments uh, from my colleagues, I would like to introduce our first panel and uh, will give us an overview of the current payment system. Uh, first, we have Kim Ford, VP of Public Affairs with First Data, Stephanie Erickson, VP of Risk Products for Visa, and Rachel McGreevy, VP of State Government Affairs and Community Relations for MasterCard. Thank you for being here today. All right, does everyone have the presentation? Great. Um, so Chairman Dababne and members of the Assembly Banking and Finance Committee, I am Kim Ford uh, with First Data. Um, First Data is a payment processor. Uh, we actually also own a debit network and we're a bank service provider. So we have this really interesting view in payments and commerce, especially when it comes to some of the plumbing behind the scenes. So what we thought I would do is, is kind of set the stage with um, some of the entities that are involved, just so you can become familiar with some of those terms and just really kind of go through how a basic debit card transaction works. And then that way, uh, my colleagues here can layer onto that uh, as they will. So um, if you'll get started here, so this first page on this presentation, um, these are really kind of the, the main entities when we think about, you know, debit card transactions. So as you see here, you've got the merchant, so clearly we know what that is, the seller of, the, of goods and services. Um, you also have an acquiring bank. So this is the bank that the merchant contracts with. So that's the one where the merchant's account is held. Then you have an acquirer processor. That's an example of what First Data does. And again, I'm going to get into, I'll show you how this all works. But acquirer processors are actually um, run some of the computer systems that send the transaction data through uh, the payments chain. You have electronic fund transfer networks, and I've included some of the uh, brands that you may have seen in the past. Um, so these also play a role uh, in, in payment uh, transaction processing and, and the routing of data. Uh, you have issuer processors, so these are processors that can work on behalf of the issuing financial institution uh, and also have a role to play in moving the data. Then you have the card issuing bank. So if you think about that as the entity where you and I would have a relationship. So if you open a checking account uh, at a financial institution, a bank or a credit union, and, and uh, you get that plastic debit card from them, that is the issuing bank. Uh, so you might hear us say card issuer, issuing bank. That's, again, that's where you've uh, opened your checking account. So now I'm going to kind of get into where, how some of these uh, entities play together. So I'm going to actually skip over slide two. So if you'll go to slide three, this is actually uh, a little more detail on what really is happening behind the scenes when we swipe a debit card. 
So if you'll kind of look there at the top, um, what basically happens, so I'm using an illustration if I've entered, if, I, if I'm using my PIN debit card. So credit cards function a little bit differently, so we're really just talking about PIN debit right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, I'm a card holder. I go up and swipe my debit card at the point of sale terminal and I enter my PIN. So what happens then is you've got this authorization request that is gonna be taken from the merchant terminal and that's usually picked up by the payment processor and they're taking that transaction data and pushing it through the chain. So next, so you, again, you've got the retailer, then you've got the processor that's taking that data, it's gonna send it through to the network and that's the network that you would see the brand on the, the card that you have. So that could be Visa, MasterCard, Star. Uh, Star is the network that First Data owns, so I've used them for the example here. Uh, and then from the network, uh, you've got uh, the, the, the transaction information has to get to the card issuing bank. So that could be done by the issuing processor or it could be sent directly to the financial institution itself. And it's really the card issuing bank that, that kind of has all the power here. They are the ones that get to say, am I going to approve this transaction or am I going to decline it? Because they're the ones holding the account, right? So they get a pretty limited amount of information that's, that's in this initial authorization, enough to where they can basically identify who the consumer is do they have an account at that financial institution and is it active? That's pretty much all that's happening in this first round of authorization. So again, the financial institution gets that information, says yes, no, if it's an approval uh, well, or decline, that, that transaction flow gets routed the same way. So again, it would then go from the card issuing financial institution back to the processor, back to the network, back to the merchant acquire processor and to the terminal where you are standing waiting to see if your transaction has been accepted. So it's, it's um, a lot of entities that are in this mix, but we have very defined roles and responsibilities in that. So, so I hope you'll remember that, again, as you're hearing some more about EMV and security and, um, you know, we each have very defined roles and responsibilities and, and we don't really stray from those. Um, so I think that real quick, all I wanted to mention as well is that's, that's kind of a typical pin debit transaction flow. If you look at slide four, um, just quickly in the interest of time, ATMs work just a little bit differently. There are just a couple less entities, if you will, uh, and you've got some fancy little pictures to walk you through that. So again, you know, the same kind of situation where a cardholder uh, puts the card into the machine, enters the PIN. In this case, though, it's really just going uh, to the network. You don't necessarily have a lot of other processors that are in the mix. And then, uh, again, to the cardholder's financial institution that gets to say, is there money in the account? You know, in this case, twenty dollars for the for the ATM transaction. Yes, no. If yes, you know, it reverses right back over those same rails, and you get your money and walk away. So, um, as you know, from a consumer perspective, we've made this whole exercise really easy, right? I mean, this is happening in seconds. All these entities and all these computer systems that are having to talk to each other and make decisions. Uh, again, for a consumer, it's really like a three second process. Um, but again, understand there is a whole sophisticated sophisticated infrastructure behind the scenes with all these folks talking to each other. And really, if you think about when we designed the payment system, we were really going for a couple things, efficiency, speed, and security. Uh, so again, I'll leave you with those thoughts. Um, I think that maybe there will be time uh, for questions after, so I will uh, conclude here and uh, know that I'm willing to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. I'm right here. Hi, I'm Stephanie Erickson from Visa. I'm Vice President of Risk Products. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Good afternoon. Um, so in terms of anything to add to what Ms. Ford said from a first data regarding the role of the networks in the payment system, we also have this other handout that was given to you. Um, so hopefully you have this in front of you, which just from a payment network point of view, if you look at slide two, it has just some very big boxes, so it's pretty simplified. Um, so if you look at it from a card network point of view, from Visa and MasterCard's perspective, we really sit as the payment network between the financial institutions that have relationships with the consumers and relationships with the merchants or the retailers. And so from a network point of view, we handle the security railroad and the messaging railroad of passing the transactions through our network from the consumer's bank 
and the merchant's bank or financial institution. And so we do a lot of investment in the security and the transaction processing environment, but we don't actually lend any credit or funds to the consumer directly or deal with the financial relationship with the merchants directly. That's done with the merchant's bank or with the consumer's financial institution, credit union, or bank. Whereas the payment network does the transferring of the transaction data from one institution to the other. And we have rules by which the system operates. And then we also have services in which we score those transactions for risk. We manage the way in which the settlement happens, the number of days in which the transactions get processed, and so forth. So just want to make sure it's really clear that we're not the ones that are actually having the financial relationships with the end consumers. However, very similar to what Ms. Ford was saying is that we're very focused on making sure that there's a balance of convenience as well as security. So making sure that the transaction environment operates efficiently and quickly, but that, that we're also investing in security so that there's confidence and trust in the payment system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rachel McGreevy with MasterCard. Um, and just to sort of round out the payment system overview, um, I wanted to walk you through uh, the journey of a transaction and just recap what happens from when, when you're thinking about this from a consumer perspective, from a constituent perspective, or your own, you, you yourself or your family with a payment card. Um, you present your card to make a purchase. And what happens with your information? The, it's the dollar amount, the date and time of the transaction, the merchant code, and the cardholder's personal account number. We call that PAN. You may hear that um, later in the discussion. Uh, that information is securely transmitted electronically from the merchant terminal to the acquiring bank through the network and onto the issuing bank, which then approves or denies the transaction as, Kim, as Ms. Ford described. Uh, this is known as the authorization message. Uh, and it works very similarly for credit as it does for debit. Um, and so that's what, that's what happens with your, uh, the information that is processed over the network um, are those four pieces. So in summary, the role of the payment network provides processing technology and operational systems. It sets standards and rules of the road builds and manages a global brand to promote usage and drive commerce, and develops new marketplace opportunities to promote acceptance. Uh, payment the payment system benefits include reliability, security, efficiency, convenience, and guaranteed payment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll start off with the first question. You know, we're talking about, obviously, the early adoption of the EMV, and I want to see how this is going to affect all three of your models here. Obviously, Visa and MasterCard having a similar model, but also uh, maybe you could start, Kim, with how this will affect your model and how it will affect consumers going forward. And then uh, if uh, Stephanie and Rachel could come from the point of view of Visa and MasterCard, I'd love to hear Sorry. a little bit more detail about how you think this new model will change things. Okay. Sure. So um, just to get started, so I'll just speak from First Data's perspective, obviously. So um, again, I mentioned that we play several roles. We're, we're a payment processor. We own a debit network. We provide back office uh, services to financial institutions, but we also have a, a point of sale terminal business. So we actually um, sell and lease terminals to merchants. And I'm talking about the, the thing that you actually use to swipe your card through. Um, so we're seeing the impacts in a number of areas because you have on the one side retailers um, that may have older point of sale terminals, uh, maybe less sophisticated, and maybe they can't just upgrade to accept this new payment security. Um, so in some cases, they're buying new terminals that are much more sophisticated and smart, and maybe they're even wireless, maybe they're mobile. You're going to be hearing more about that um, as well. But So there are a number of decisions, obviously, that a retailer has to make about which, which point of sale terminal is going to work for them, right? Um, so you know, in that case, though, from an EMV standpoint, um, the consumer experience will change in the fact that they may not, they'll no longer be swiping the card. They may be dipping it or they may be waving it or tapping it, depending on a number of factors. Um, but kind of the handoff that occurs after that point is really still the same type of transaction. Um, so yes, there is more security, uh, but again, the process flow doesn't really change. Um, one area that we're also seeing, um, and then I'll let my colleagues speak, is that um, because we're a bank service provider, we're having lots of conversations, as are the networks, um, with our financial institution customers of all sizes, you know, community banks, credit unions, large financial institutions, uh, because there are a lot of decisions that go in 
into this EMV process. It's not just as simple as picking out a chip, right? There are a whole bunch of decisions that they have to make. And a lot of that is really based on their own cardholder and consumers, right? They're making decisions that are going to work best for that you know, con their own constituents. Um, so again, we're, we're having lots of discussion um, with them to try to figure out and, you know, help guide them along the way to make the decision that's going to work best for their cardholders. Very good, thing. For many of you retailers, they don't really have a choice because when the law kicked in that you're only the last four numbers on your credit card must show an address, they went through changes. They had to change their POS to the tune of about $6,000 per location. And now with European cards coming to the market, if they were able to accept it, they have to change it. So I don't think there's much choice for the retailers but to spend that money to comply and be able to accept. And with the credit card use, which is almost 85% of any retailers, and at quite an expense, 2.5% plus, that's adding up. So. Yeah. I, so I don't know if there's any. Mr. Chair, would it would it be the appropriate time to provide an overview of the EMV chip technology? I would, I would appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I'll just give a little bit of background information, and then we can address specifically My only your concern. concern is that retailers are being forced into changes because technology is changing, and I'm all happy about it that because it's a matter of security, mm -hmm. but also got to have a little bit of a, a consciousness about the retailer's pocket as well. I'm, lo I'm looking for the small business person. Yes, yeah. yes. You know, before we do that, why don't we switch to the second panel? And I think, Kim, thank you so much Absolutely. for being very helpful <laughs> and very informative on the overview of the process thank once you. the card's swiped. And we'll call up for the second panel, uh, besides Rachel uh, and Stephanie, we also would like to welcome Bill Dombrowski from uh, the California Retailers Association. He's president and CEO. And Alex Alanis, VP of State Government Relations for the California Bankers Association, if they join us as well. Thank you for being here. So before we go back and rehash that one, we have um, Bill and Alex open up, and then we'll <clears throat> go into the discussion of EMV. Okay. Do you want me to go first? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Bill Dombrowski, California Retailers Association. Thank you for having me. Um, I think everybody in the room knows how important payment card security is to retailers after what's happened over the last few years and all of the headlines. Um, the industry today is, is facing a massive conversion. Um, we are trying to go to our standards chip and pin. And let me talk about that a little bit. Um, it's kind of ironic. The U.S., which is usually a trailblazer in technology, is still using the 1970s magnetic strip. And, you know, it's causing quite a bit of fraud. Uh, fraud is 50% more prevalent in the U.S. compared to other parts of the world. 25% more fraud occurs here because of our use of the outdated, outdated magnetic strip. On contrast, when you have the pin technology with the chip, Retailers in England have experienced a 67% less fraud. And lost or stolen credit cards have decreased 58%. For years, retailers have urged card companies and financial institutions to switch to chip and pin, particularly since retailers bear many of the costs associated with fraud. That's because when fraud occurs, retailers pay penalties, fines, and fees to card companies. Card companies pay some of these costs as well, but they're able to recoup some of that with their fees and other services. Card networks are now issuing chip cards without the PIN technology in the United States. This is a serious issue for us because the retail industry is investing, as Cacho said, enormous amounts of money into their stores with an expectation of a return on investment. The chip's an important component, but it's not going to reduce the fraud without the PIN technology. Now, how far are we along in implementation? Well, it, I think it's pretty, pretty clear the major retailers are much further along than the small retailer. Uh, and I think Visa or MasterCard has a better sense of how long it's going to really take to get through the whole small retailer segment. But the large retailers are, are well underway. Approximately 20% of your terminals 
we estimate in the country right now are chip and pin technology ready. Uh, unfortunately, there's not many chip and pin cards out there. Um, I've been asked about some of the alternative payment methods, Apple Pay, some of those. Uh, frankly, the data we've been able to gather is the usage of that is so minuscule it's almost impossible to measure at this point. Uh, and there's other issues with that type of payment program. So in summary, retailers, we're moving along, we're making the investments. Uh, we are strongly in favor of chip and pin, and that's where we would like to end up as quickly as possible. <laughs> Thank you. We'll hold questions to all the speakers, but Alex, if you'd like to. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Alex Alanis with the California Bankers Association. A CBA represents over 65 percent of banks doing business in California. Um, our members manage over 90 percent of bank assets in the state, though. For some time, our members have been greatly concerned about the growing incidences of payment card fraud. Uh, there have been many attempts to start, stop fraud before the card information is actually compromised. But that has not reduced the fraudulent activity to a level that we feel very comfortable with. Uh, more has to be done to make unlawfully acquired payment card information useless to the hacker. Uh, card, chip embedded cards will provide this much needed protection against credit fraud. Um, in speaking with our membership, uh, we are in target to um, exceed the goals to be EMV compliant, which we're at 70 percent. And uh, in some instances, our members are about to be, by the end of the year, about 90 percent compliant with EMV. As the year progresses, though, you'll expect to see a selective rollout of EMV cards. Instead of a mass uh, distribution of EMV cards, you're looking more so like portfolios are being replaced, and it's more of a managed effort to at least um, bring these out and have them done at least by October, um, if not by the end of the year. Um, and each bank will set their own portfolio management schedule, how they see fit with their bank. Um, as the EMV rollout continues apace, we'll need retailer acceptance, though, to take hold in order to have a significant reduction in point-of-sale fraudulent activity. The sooner the merchants uh, purchase and begin using EMV terminals, the sooner the incidences of point-of-sale fraud will drop. Uh, the card issuance industry rollout is based on chip and signature, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, EMV is the foundation for a much stronger security system. It is the chip itself with its unique identifier for each transaction that provides the protection against fraudulent point of sale transactions. Uh, EMV supports additional authentication features as well, such as biometrics and tokenization. Uh, this advanced two factor authentication provides necessary security while also providing the customer with a seamless and convenient transaction. Uh, further, chip and signature does not require uprooting the existing system but provides enhanced security needed to protect against point of sale fraud. It also allows for a quicker rollout rather than one that would take many years to implement with de minimis security. There have been other industries uh, calling for chip and pin. This requirement is unnecessary because the chip is the override security feature. Uh, requiring a pin for a credit card transaction is, is I think, uh, akin to asking someone to wear a football helmet while driving uh, a car with uh, seat belts and airbags. Um, it does not provide any appreciable additional security for preventing counterfeit fraud. Uh, PIN really addresses what's known as loss and stolen cards. Uh, so loss and stolen uh, fraud really is 13 percent of fraudulent activity. 83 percent of fraudulent activity on a card is either counterfeit or what's known as card not present, which is online or tele telephone fraud. Um, there is no need to water your lawn when your house is on fire. We need to go to the actual, the, the main problem here, which is uh, counterf counterfeit fraud information is mostly acquired by data security breaches. According to the nonprofit Identity Theft Resource Center, 80% of records breached were at retail establishments. Also, according to Attorney General Kamala Harris, 84 percent of records compromised were at the retail level. Uh, according to both of these entities, only 1 percent came from the financial industry. Um, as was mentioned about chip and pin and a, curtain, a certain type of program here, we're talking about a program here that actually not only takes your personal information, but also takes your financial information and couples that with 
your buying habits. And all that information can be on a server within a retail establishment that doesn't have the proper data security requirements that could be subject to a breach. I think people should be very uncomfortable of having payment information, personal information, and buying habits out in the public sphere, whether it be used for whatever nefarious purposes. Calling for chip and pen, I think, is a way to delay EMV rollout and to promote another form of payment systems, which I think would actually give us less security than it's necessary. Therefore, I think as the financial institutions industry continues to be innovative in combating payment fraud, we continue to provide zero liability to our customers and engage our partners in the payments ecosystem to provide the necessary data security protections and investments as soon as possible. Once we all move forward together, we can provide consumers with much needed payment card protection coupled with quick and comfortable payment experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. I will say um, in your comments on the EMV override and the system, uh, Ms. McGreevy, if you could touch on something that he pointed out that how will this affect uh, online commerce and internet sales as well with the EMV system? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm just take oh, sorry. Oh, oh Rachel <laughs> McGreevy. Yeah. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And maybe just taking a step back, one thing we can all agree on is EMV chip technology. I think that when you look at the entire payment system, um, we all agree that it is the future of payment security. It is a layer in the in the uh, securing the pay, um, card payments into the future. So with that being said, that we all support EMV, I want to just give you a, a little bit of a description of the technology itself because I think that's helpful to the discussion. Um, it is a, um, and I also just want to say I, that protecting cardholders and merchants before, during, and after a payment transaction is truly one of the non-negotiable parts of our business. So with that also being said, um, the, here's uh, just a quick description of the EMV chip technology, which was developed in 1996 um, by MasterCard, Europay, and Visa. And EMV, so it stands, the acronym, that's where it came from. It's a technology. It, it is a standard for globally interoperable secure payments. And it, of course, has had great success in protecting from fraud in Europe and elsewhere. It, uh, put simply, it's a system whereby older technologies, such as the magnetic stripe, are replaced or supplemented by a microchip uh, that is actually on the card. And the chip acts as a microprocessor and generates dynamic data each time it is used. This allows for dynamic authentication, whether it's a PIN or a signature or a biometric or another way to verify the cardholder, to authenticate the cardholder. The technology is in that dynamic um, data that is, that is generated with each with each um, use of that card. It makes it radically more difficult for criminals to intercept or steal the information because of that dynamic component. Um, in addition, the presence of chip technology on an EMV card makes creating counterfeit cards significantly more difficult, reducing the risk of fraudulent transactions even if there is an account data compromise. Um, my colleague Alex mentioned the Attorney General Kamala Harris. Um, I, I would just, I will, um, I was going to jump to the roadmap, Stephanie, but you, but um, if you would like to add to that piece of